welcome to the show, where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have Eric Gantworker. He is a pediatric otolaryngologist, and he wrote the Kevin MD article, Healthcare's Tech Renaissance During the Pandemic Extends to Medical Training. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I grew up in Chicago. I uh, went to uh, undergrad at University of Illinois. Uh, I actually was a chemical engineer uh, before I changed into uh, medicine, pre-med. I went to Rush Medical College in Chicago, then went on to residency in otolaryngology in Cincinnati, and then uh, completed my otolaryngology fellowship training in pediatric otolaryngology at Boston Children's uh, in Boston. Uh, and uh, following my fellowship training, I actually got a master's in medical education. My specific focus was on educational technology, educational research, and the cognitive science of learning and games. And out of that, I got some consulting opportunities in the technology space. And that's sort of where brought me to, to today, where I split my time 50-50 between academic clinical practice and working for a technology company. Excellent. Tell me some of the, the challenges that you had overcome to kind of move into that healthcare technology space as a physician. Yeah, there was a lot. So uh, number one skill set. So I wanted to expand my own skill set and try to learn more about the technology space and specifically about educational technology. So the number one thing I had to do was expand that skill set. The other was there was a cultural uh, uh, obstacle that I had. In fact, one of the pillars in my own specialty, who I finally met, you know, he was one of the fathers of pediatric oncology. I met him at a dinner and uh, he asked what I did. And I said, I split my time uh, with a technology company and clinical practice. And he said, what a waste of your education and walked away. And so there was definitely a cultural obstacle that I had to overcome in people who are like, why are you doing stuff outside of medicine? Why are you going into this other area? And so it's been hard uh, trying to slip my time 50-50 between clinical practice and the technology company trying to balance that time and find mentors in that area has also been difficult. How do you answer that question to people who question your commitment to medicine by having interests outside of clinical medicine? Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough question, and I think you know you had actually a podcast with uh, Akash Sharma and Amelia Biki, um, who were talking about that three legged stool, and and that three legged stool, which used to be, uh, you know, uh, practicing medicine, doing education, research. Um, I think that another leg of those stools are now uh, interest outside of clinical practice. Number one, because of burnout, which was something that they talked about, but also because I think that there is uh, opportunities that we have as physicians to provide to society using our expertise in other areas outside of clinical practice or adjacent to clinical practice. And I think technology is one of those spaces where we can actually lead that discussion and actually try to um, bring our expertise to that world. Otherwise, it's going to develop without us. And so usually my answer is, is we have an opportunity to ch make change in society for the better and for healthcare. And I'd rather be part of that discussion than be on the sidelines. And what are some of the specific things that you did to expand your skill set into this technology space? That's a great question. So the first thing was, is when I got my master's, uh, I re had relatively open ability to uh, sign up for classes that I liked um, and that I wanted to. And so I, I did go into the technology and innovation entrepreneurship type space. And so took classes at the education school, the public health school. I took classes at MIT. Um, also all, all sort of focused on educational technology and trying to understand that better skill set. The other was opportunities that came to me. So the video game company that I work for now um, has rapidly expanded my skill set and understanding how video game psychology and technology can actually lend itself to education. And so I think understanding that and, and just immersing myself in that world and, in, you know, consuming all the content on, uh, on augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, uh, AI and medicine and, and learning from other people in the uh, medical healthcare digital space um, has been really, really eye-opening for me and expanded my knowledge and skill set. Right. So let's transition now into your Kevin MD article, Healthcare's Tech Renaissance During the Pandemic Extends to Medical Training. Now, for those who didn't read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? 
Yeah, so one of the things that I started noticing was uh, the immediate impact of the pandemic was that our hospital closed um, to anything elective. So we no longer had patients coming in for elective clinics, procedures, um, and basically everything was shunted over taking care of acute care COVID patients. And so one of the things, the immediate impact was that patients didn't have access. If you had some medical problem, you couldn't go just go see your doctor unless it was an emergency or COVID related. And the other was the hospital revenue Dropped off the dropped off the cliff because a lot of revenue is generated from those elective cases, from those elective procedures, and seeing patients in clinic. And you started to see telemedicine, and telehealth really start to take hold. And I saw some of my senior colleagues who were struggling with technology, and it sort of harkened back to th me thinking about education and how education has uh, uh, could benefit so much more from technology. And so I sort of made that that um, that analogy with okay, medicine has needed telemedicine probably um, in general, and it's existed for many years, but we've never adopted it. Part of that was financial and part mm -hmm. of it was the sort of that um, resistance to change and resistance to technology. And so that's where it sort of got me thinking about this and understanding how we can actually see the pandemic as a silver lining to try and actually force technology adoption into an area that we were traditionally very slow to adopt. So give us some examples of how you think technology can intersect with medical education. Yeah, so I think the two biggest problems we've seen is, is the learning losses from lack of physical presence in both knowledge and skills. And so I think from a knowledge standpoint, we see that didactics are now being removed to remote. So we see a lot of people leveraging teleconferencing. We see a lot of people using more collaborative based software solutions, uh, even game and software based solutions, I think are starting to try and fill that gap, both synchronously with other people, as well as asynchronously. How can we create content that people can consume? on their own without actually having to be co-located with a facilitator or actually with patients. And then from a skill standpoint, we have this experiential learning loss of actual physical skills. And so again, we're starting to see virtual reality, augmented reality, all these technologies that people can go in their home and practice these skills before they're actually coming to see patients or actually performing the procedures in real life. And so we're starting to see those really start to gain traction. And you can see these VR companies and these VR surgical companies really starting to explode specifically during the pandemic. Is there anything lost from an educational standpoint, virtual versus real life? Are there any studies comparing the two? Absolutely. So we're, we're starting to see a little bit more of those. Right now, we're still in that, um, as far as the hype curve is concerned, we're still into the, uh, we're very optimistic. And I think we're going to start to start to realize where those technologies really excel. One of the problems has always been the mechanical aspect of surgery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have talked about the haptics. So haptics being that physical ability to manipulate and feel force, perceive force, and the actual tactile feedback from the devices. And so I think we still aren't there yet. And that's probably what we would call the holy grail in simulation is trying to create that haptic feedback and that um, force feedback that you just can't get with some of these technologies. But I still see a lot of huge opportunities because if you learn a lot of the skills and know what to look for, then your brain can actually focus on the mechanical aspect of actually enacting that plan. And you don't have to hyper-focus on everything all at once. So right now, how many medical schools are using some of the technologies that you subscribe as part of their education? Um, I know that there are some medical schools that have virtual gross anatomy labs, for instance, but how many of these academic facilities are using something like that or even like training surgeons remotely? Yeah, so training surgeons remotely, I say, is probably very, very few. I think a lot more people are trying to look at um, anatomy labs and seeing if we could actually use either synthetic materials. There's actually some cadaver companies that are trying to make 3D printed synthetic materials uh, for dissection, as well as virtual reality. So places like Cleveland Clinic, Case Western, that are very well known for using one of the uh, augmented realities for their, um, for their anatomy courses. I still don't think we're there yet where we can completely replace them, but I do see more and more schools looking to add those types of uh, experiences to enhance the learning, not necessarily replace just yet. So I would say the majority of institutions are looking to at least uh, dip their toe in and see what it's, see what's the possibility space. Um, very few, I think, are have fully integrated into their curriculums. So what do you see the next few years to bring when it comes to technology and medical education? What do you feel are the technologies that's closest to fruition? And what do you see are the technologies that are kind of further off? Yeah, so I think um, right now, 
uh, obviously digital therapeutics are really starting to hit the ground running. We just had obviously a, a medication or a, a, a game prescribed for ADHD. So I think one of the things you're starting to see very, very quickly is uh, digital therapeutics and point of care solutions. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we'll see in healthcare practice is that these more decision support tools are going to be at the ready. And so we actually need to create curriculum and education around um, teaching people how to use those, right? So at what point do you use a decision support tool or uh, one of these AI enabled um, data repositories to help you actually practice medicine? One of the probably next um, biggest things is adaptive learning. We already see this with NEDGEM. So the New England Journal of Medicine has a, a solution where they actually use adaptive learning, which means that if you answer a question a certain way, it can actually detect whether you know that, how well you know that. And over a series of questions, it actually dynamically serves you content. So content that is specific to your needs. So I think adaptive learning is probably um, the first and foremost that I would like to see involved more that we're already starting to see more and more. I think the uh, robotics, we already see robotics definitely taking hold and being able to do robotic bronchoscopy using a, uh, using a joystick, um, obviously with the, uh, the uh, uh, functional robotic surgery systems. Um, all of those types of things I think are the here and now, and we can actually train residents and trainees on on those actual devices. Um, I also see software-based simulation really starting to take off. People are getting better at coding. People are getting at creating these software-based simulations, these patient simulators. I think we'll see a lot more of those. I think AI and big data is probably a little bit further off. We still don't know quite sure how to use it. We don't know how to use it in education just yet, but I think with software-based solutions feeding a lot of data back about our learners, we actually might uh, get some really great insights into how people learn, how to be most efficient with how people learn and using those adaptive learning platforms. And then the last thing I think is, is uh, extended reality. So augmented reality, virtual reality. We're still figuring out how best to use those. I think those are still a few years out because we still have people who are using virtual reality. I, I would say not the best way to leverage it for educational purposes. Um, so we're still trying to find our sweet spot with VR. And I still think that's a few years out. We're talking to Eric Gantworker. He's a pediatric otolaryngologist, and he wrote the Kevin MD article, Healthcare's Tech Renaissance During the Pandemic Extends to Medical Training. Eric, I'm sure a lot of listeners who listen to your story may be inspired to move into that healthcare technology space. What would you recommend their first steps to be if they want to pursue that route? I think that's a great question. And really when it comes down to it, you have to understand your own skill set. So for me, it was building out that skill set. Uh, you don't have to get a master's. You don't have to uh, go out and do a bunch of coursework, even doing reading and getting yourself acquainted to what that space is and where your own passions and skill sets lie. So understanding my passion, my passion was education. My passion was educational technology and building my skill set there. The next, uh, the next step was actually finding either their mentors or opportunities. So opening yourself up to those opportunities, thinking outside the box, being bold, trying to see where your skill set will um, allow you to leverage those skills that you just built. Um, and I think we, one of the things we're getting better about is building communities of physician innovators and entrepreneurs. And technology is a really strong component of that. And so obviously, subscribe to different groups, start following different people, start reaching out. One of the things that I've really learned in this space is when when you reach out to different people who are really high up in these organizations, who are also physicians, as a physician, they're actually very willing to speak with you and mentor you. And that's been a huge surprise to me that these people in these very high positions in technology companies are actually willing to share their expertise and their knowledge and be mentors. And I think you just have to be the one to take that first step and reach out to them. And my final question, what's your take home message you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? You know, as always, I say, be bold, be innovative, and don't accept the status quo. Try to be on the edge, trying to force technology and adoption in the future and trying to think creatively about how we can solve some of these problems and be a solutions expert. Um, that would be my advice. Eric, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me.